No, oh, isn't it amazing? Our fourth one officially, and plus we read a bunch of other books on the side that we don't talk about every month. But we are really excited to have Dave Lingerfeld join us this time uh, and going forward. He's a new member of our team. And uh, Dave and we, Dave, Brett and I all know each other from Rockhurst University, and uh, where I'm an adjunct, but Dave is the, I wrote down your official title, <laughs> title, 10 years professor at Rockhurst, executive assistant professor. Very nice. So welcome, Dave. You want to share a little bit about your background? Yeah, thank you. That that title sounds way more official than it is. Very was. fancy. Uh, they struggled <laughs> with what to call me, and I think that was the nicest thing they could come up with. So uh, uh, thank you, you both for inviting me to join. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a great opportunity for, for me to, to, you know, kind of share and, and you know, hopefully uh, take away a lot from this as well. So uh, I started my, my professional career uh, working at Cerner. I'm in the technical space, uh, did that for uh, about 10 years before moving into a full-time job in academia. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough that I get to work in a lot of different areas, but mostly healthcare data analytics uh, is the, the bulk of what I do. Um, so it's and needless to say, it's been fairly busy lately with uh, data analytics around COVID data and, and all of that fun stuff. So uh, very happy to join you guys and uh, looking forward to the experience. So thanks for having me. Um, and Dave, I never said this to you, but you kind of got on my radar when the analytics um, degrees started being discussed like five years ago or so, and you were one of the leaders in all of that. And uh, so always um, kind of just had my attention in those um, executive summer summits that Rockhurst hosts in the fall. Mm -hmm. And um, we're a leader in, in that. You have always, always been a leader in all of that. So I'm really excited to get to work with you in, in this way and uh, share what we can share on leadership. All right, thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brett, how about an update from you? Well, uh, I think where we're at here is uh, we wanted to find out about some of the other things that you're doing, Kelly, outside of this conversation with leaders. I know you're really active on LinkedIn and have several other posts and videos that you do. Share just a little bit about that if you would. Yeah, thanks. So uh, the consulting firm I work with is Voyage Consulting Group, and we have um, we were established to work in the um, company culture space. The last couple of years, that was all topsy-turvy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and my work in 2020 um, beyond March or April was uh, delayed. And uh, hopefully we'll pick up this year. But um, actually I did just revamp the uh, culture evolution process. So it is ready to go and um, it's updated. It's always been qualitative and quantitative, but now there's more related to the hybrid environment and the great resignation and other key issues that are uh, facing the employers today that weren't really um, key challenges or on their minds five or six years ago when that was created. So. Um, so yeah, that's it really been speaks thing. to the change right now and what's right. going on, doesn't it? Right. And the purpose of my tool is to excavate below the surface because they don't, things don't come up if you only do a survey. So I have a lot of other ways to really get at the truth of what's going on in organizations and then um, give that insight to the uh, senior team so they're able to make some decisions um, about new products and ideas or markets, or if there is something they need to change about their culture and and evolve it a little bit, especially related to things going on right now. So that's been- It's funny uh, you touched on culture. You know, that's one of the topics that we've got coming up down the road. So mm -hmm. very, very timely. Uh, you know, we're so thankful for all the feedback that we've got. And each month, the comments have gotten longer, more of them, more valuable. Yeah. Last month, we got a book suggested, which was fantastic. That's the first time that that's happened. So month three, we got a book. Uh, ironically, and I, I'm so, so proud of this one, Dory Clark, who was the author of last month's book that we did, The Long Game. Uh, and for those of you who re weren't with us, New York Times bestseller, member of the Thinkers 50, uh, national keynote speaker, member of the Fuqua School at Duke University, as well as Columbia University, uh, extremely well regarded within the leadership and consulting community, actually commented on uh, last month's LinkedIn post. So very, very excited to see that our audience and our following are, is gaining some traction there. Yeah. So very, very happy about that. Uh, before we get into this month's topic, which Kelly's did a good job of teeing up Liz Wiseman's impact player, I wanted to share this email that I've got. And, and I can't tell you how I got on this email distro list, but the gentleman's name is Gary Bernison. He's the CEO of Corn Ferry, which many of you know Corn Ferry, a big national company, does a lot of different things uh, in a lot of different spaces, but most, mostly with HR. But anyway, uh, Gary, ironically, is from Kansas, and, and Kelly 
Uh, Dave and I all live in Kansas City, but Gary grew up in Kansas. So many of his emails have to do with the things he learned, you know, growing up in rural Kansas. And I believe uh, through some research, I believe he now lives in California. But he sends out these emails. And, and uh, like I said, they just speak to, uh, you know, a rural kid growing up in, in the country. And this last one here, I, I was so good as I was reading it. It was the February 6th email. I just said, hey, I've got to share this. This is right spot on to what we've got here. So I'm going to quote just a little bit of this here and, and I'll be brief. But it says, uh, uh, we all sit, this is quoting from the email, we all sit at the intersection of potential and opportunity, potential and opportunity. Potential is the common denominator. We all have potential. And then he goes on to say, but it will remain a mere fraction. Note the connection between potential as the denominator and the reference to fraction. Let's pick it up. It says, without the numerator of opportunity, after all, leadership in essence is creating opportunities for others. And if you've there's a lot of quotes out there that are similar to that. So end quote. And I said, the email is just rich with content. And so what I did is I asked Kelly to post that. And uh, I, I'm not sure, Kelly, can you tell us where you're going to post that so our, our listeners know where to find that? Because I do want everybody to kind of unpackage that as their time allows. Um, it is posted. And I just remembered I can post a banner. Um let me edit this. It is on the Voyage Consulting Group website. And if you do voyagecg.com slash, it's leadership books. And that should come. There you go. That's the website. Um, there's a handout there and the email is there as well. So um, Great. there's a handout for Thanks for doing topic. that. And yeah, I'm excited cool. to share it with people. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a great one. So let's roll back a few minutes. And I, I have this this. I, it's not a theory, but it's this idea that you will find that which you seek. And, and it seems pretty obvious, right? I mean, it's not all that um, revolutionary, right? But it's this idea of being intentional. So you say to yourself, well, what's the question? What are you seeking? You know, I'm seeking to be the best possible leader that I can be. And by doing that, I'm seeking inspiration and content. And I find that in Gary Bernison's email. So you ask yourself, what are you seeking? You know, what do you aspire to be? And then recall all these different things. And I think that's so, so important. So I hope you see the value in Gary Bernison's email the same way I did. Maybe you sign up for that. I mean, it's, it's obviously free. But, uh, you know, the other point that we wanted to make, and we've made this in several other things, and, and some of these are from Bernison's email. You know, if you're not actionable, if you're not intentionable, after 72 hours of learning a new topic or learning a new technique or new content, it's lost. So the idea of being a better leader, and this is a conversation about leadership, is putting those things into action. So kind of take that for what it's worth, but I found that to be very powerful. So yeah, let's transition into the basis for this month's conversation, which is uh, Liz Wiseman's Impact Players, how to take the lead, play bigger, and multiply your impact. So she was a executive at Oracle Corporation. She's currently now the CEO of the Wiseman Group, which is a leadership consulting group. Uh, and she, at the time she was at Oracle, she was the vice president of uh, Oracle University, which is obviously training and personal development. So she's got a ton of background, a ton of experience on leadership, which is what we'll talk about today. But uh, the thing that, that I like, and I know Kelly and I talked about this in our pregame, she supports her personal experience with a tremendous amount of research. So uh, those are the books and those are the topics and the authors that we really, really like as people that have personal experience and then overlay that with leadership here. So um, I, I wanted to make a note. You can see if I got value out of the book by the number of tabs that I put in here, there's I, there's got to be 25. of them. When I read a book, I have a little yellow post-it pad with me and I just drop a post-it note in there for all the pages that I've got. So uh, Dave, what was your opinion of the book real quick? Yeah, for me, it's, uh, you know, when I crack open a new book, it's always, you know, if it doesn't grab my attention in the first two or three pages, the likelihood of me finishing that book is is significantly low. Mm -hmm. um, and and as I, I started reading the book within the first couple of paragraphs, it grabbed me, you know, real quickly. And and I'll be totally honest, when uh, Kelly first asked me to join this, I um, just downloaded the free sample on my, my Kindle and thought, <laughs> let's just see how this goes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was one of those where I, I was getting ready to crash for the night and I, I pull up the, the Kindle and I'm reading and reading. And before I know it, it says, well, you're out of the free sample. And it's like, OK, I've, I've read the entire thing without going, how long is this thing? Um, yeah. so it got my attention pretty quick as well. And I found myself uh, within the first few pages of the book starting to 
draw parallels to things I have done um, in my career. And I, I won't say I did it as well as she describes many of the things in the book, but I found myself going, okay, I kind of did that. Here's how I kind of could have done it better. And I, I found mm -hmm. myself having to stop and really dissect some of my past experiences and going, okay, how could I have kind of taken that to the next level? So yeah, I thought it was a, a great book. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Yes, same, almost the exact same thing. And I thought, hey, I did that pretty well. And then the next point that she makes, like, uh, okay, I could see why I was annoying to a group by how I right. approached, you know, because these impact players, if you're too pushy, uh, mm -hmm. some people don't like that. So uh, that stung a couple times, I have to say. But uh, I think this, this became one of my favorite books. I'm going to add it to my list. Uh, well, much. for everybody that's listening, if you're not getting the ringing endorsement of this book, boy, it's certainly there. I I, yeah. I echo everything that Dave and Kelly said. This is probably one of the best that I've read in a long, long time. So yeah. uh, it will definitely be one of the foundational and bedrock books that we'll put on our reading list. So we've talked about it in, in other broadcasts about the fact that authors read other authors. And uh, she she lists several, but I, I wanted to call it a couple. The first one was leading with gratitude, eight leadership practices. And we haven't done that one yet, but I bet we do at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the ones that she used was the one big thing, which if you've been on our previous conversations, that's by Gary Keller of the Keller Williams Real Estate Company. And then Radical Candor by Kim Scott. We haven't read that one yet, but that one is pretty popular. And then Obviously, this one is Foundational Growth Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, who's a Stanford University professor. So, you know, the, you, you kind of put value in these ones that come up again and again and again. And if, if multiple authors refer to the text, you know, you can kind of assume or expect that you're onto something hot. And those are mm -hmm. ones that kind of come back up again. So we this book, is, as Kelly mentioned, kind of targets the individual Uh Weisman also wrote Multipliers, which she released before Impact Players. And why Multipliers centers more on culture and the team and things like that. And I expect that as we develop our conversations and move into those topics that we'll probably come back to Multipliers because it's equally as good. So uh, if it's okay with Dave and Kelly, let's jump into the book. Yes? Yeah, sounds good. So I'm going to jump to Chapter 2. And the title of Chapter 2 is Make Yourself Useful. And she kind of goes through... The, the, her very first year at Oracle, she found herself without a chair and that, you know, kind of a saying, but she was, she was new and the team that she was working for was disbanded the way she said in the book. And she had an idea that she wanted to pitch called a, a, a management boot camp. And she went to the VP that she was reporting to at the time. And basically she pitched this idea and the, and the VP dismissed it almost immediately and just said, hey, you know, we don't have time for that. And, and I always like to share cliches. I'm a big, big guy on quotes and cliches. And the, the one I thought of when I read that was I'm too busy fighting fires for fire prevention. And yeah. <laughs> everybody can feel free to use that one. It's not a new one, but I like that. So she basically listened to this VP who basically put down her idea and said, hey, you know, what, what do you need? And uh, he shared that they needed to train 2,000 new Oracle associates and how to function with the Oracle technology. And, you know, she's seeing an opportunity to say it. she she shelved, at least temporarily, because she did ultimately launch the management boot camp, but not at that time. And she basically set about building curriculum and building, you know, the training materials to train these 2,000 new Oracle employees. And and again, she, she frames this under doing the job that needs to be done. So we always like to take concepts from the book and then say, how have we applied these similarly in our personal life? In a previous job I was at, we didn't have a dedicated m and team, you know, mergers and acquisitions, but the company had a strategic initiative to go down that path and acquire companies. And I had the sales leadership experience and all the financial training that I had at Rockers. And I said, you know what, give me some time. I think I can put this together. And I was so blessed to be given the resources, human resources, other people that kind of formed the team. And we put together the financial forecasts and everything that we needed for a preliminary M&A assessment of some potential targets. And then presented those to Treasury and the senior leadership team. Not the job that I had, uh, you know, a job that I, I kind of felt like I was equipped to do, but it was the job that needed to be done. And I, I, I just can speak from personal experience. I learned more on that project and grew more in that opportunity by saying, pick me, follow me, I'll make it happen versus saying, hey, you know what, uh, that's out of my wheelhouse. I can't do it. But mm -hmm. it, it just really speaks to that idea of doing the job that needs to be done. I think I've shared with the folks, I'm currently with an early stage food production company. And that's just a sexy way of saying, hey, it's a small company where you wear a lot of hats. And I was reading impact players 
and reading that section on doing the job that needs to be done. And I said, hey, this is exactly the same conversation that we just had at the company. And I brought the book in and I plopped it down on the conference table with the team. And I said, look, we all just had this conversation about wearing multiple hats. And here it is in copy in the books, the exact same thing. Dave, what's your comment? Yeah, I, I, I again was kind of reflecting personally when I was I was reading this, and uh, you know, just kind of that desire to just come forward and, and bring this idea and say, here, here's what I think we ought to do, and get told, no, we're we're not going to go do it. Um, it kind of my first reaction was it reminded me years ago I read uh, uh, Jack Welch's uh, autobiography um, and how. He send it up through GE by doing a lot of the same thing of, you know, just being real relentless and coming forward with all these potential ideas and, you know, getting outside of my job description, right? And, and what are things I can do that aren't necessarily spelled out in my job description? And it reminded me of, uh, you know, the last institution I was at, where is also in academia and trying to grow uh, a program and trying to get employers to agree to take our students on as as interns provide job opportunities, and it was it was a new 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 emerging field, and employers were very inclined to say no. And uh, what I finally learned was you're you're gonna you're gonna schedule ten meetings with ten different people, and you're gonna get told no nine times. But that one time you get told yes, um, it's the culmination of taking those nine no's and figuring out exactly what it was that, that I kind of did wrong. So that's that's kind of where I really connected with that chapter, um, just kind of getting out in front of it. Again, going outside of that job description, making yourself useful in the day to day, helping solve a real problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and right. it's not the same problem for everyone. And, mm -hmm. you know, somebody, your expertise might not be needed for that problem at some companies. I see this with entrepreneurs all the time, where they, um, entrepreneurs can get to have one, air, one area of focus or expertise, and then nobody's buying it. Okay, well, then that you're not solving the problem that they have. Mm -hmm. You know, what are people talking about? What's their challenge? What are what's the current problem? And go solve that. Mm -hmm. So even whatever your job description says, and she mentions that throughout the book many times, mm -hmm. whatever your job description is, focus on the um, the agenda, focus on the most important issues. Mm -hmm. um, in that chapter, I really liked um, when she says um, a service mindset, which I'm all about that. That alone isn't enough to tackle the messiest problems. Other underlying mindsets come to play, including a strong sense of agency where I can do that. I can be independent. I can make decisions and the internal locus of control um, that I control the outcome of events in my life. So I think those are two important things to um, bring into this can do spirit. It's sense of agency and locus of control as well. And, you know, serving. So let's wrap up chapter two. There was one other yep. point I wanted to make. She, she uses the acronym WIN, W-I-N, and her, her, what, her, the extension of the acronym is what's important now. And as I read that, I, I couldn't help but recall Gary Keller's one big, the one big thing. So you can see some similarities there. there obviously, mm -hmm. it's packaged a little bit differently. But for those of you who were on that conversation that we had, very, very similar to where we're at right now. So uh, let's go ahead and jump to chapter four real quickly. Now, hold on, that, hold on just a second. I just yeah. want to point out for everybody, um, she gives great tools at the end of each chapter. Mm -hmm. um, the chapters are kind of laid out similarly where she shares three habits for each of these five characteristics of high impact players. She shares um, three habits and then she shares some um, detractors, uh, some things we can watch for to not sabotage us in trying to do those habits. And then she shares some tools at the end of each chapter as well. So we picked out just so we're not trying to do a review of every single chapter of the book and the time that we have. Um, um, Brett kind of led the way on this one and picked out three of his favorites and we'll chime in. So then we're going to go to chapter four, which is the third of her uh, five characteristics. So take us away, Brett. Yeah. So chapter four is titled Finish Stronger. And she did a bunch of research on things that frustrated managers. And, and one of the things that she said that frustrated them the most was the failure to finish. And, and she goes into some detail about that. But she said, you know, she's tried to find different solutions and she's just very frustrated with that. So I wanted to share again my personal experience because I had the same experience as a manager where you just get different frustrated or different frustrations. And I went back to Dr. Tracy Blaisdell's class, which was communications mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
management communication. And she introduced me to the, the uh, what we call the four memo, F-O-R, facts, op to options, and uh, recommendations. And I took that from that class that I had with Dr. Blaisdell and implemented it with my team. And once we created that habit, you know, someone would send me an email and give me a problem without a solution. And I would fire back at that same email and reply and say, you know, this fits a four memo. And once basically people started to recognize that if they sent me a problem or sent me an email that was out of that format, they were going to get that reply. And it was amazing once we created that good habit, how that just kind of became ingrained in our culture. And it addressed this very challenge that Wiseman found in her survey of this failure to finish. Mm -hmm. Dave? Yeah. Uh, so when when I, I read that chapter, one thing that kind of resonated with, with me was, you know, I mentioned I, I worked at Cerner for some time and, and kind of some of their kind of cultural beliefs, um, you know, I, I still kind of follow today. And, uh, you know, one thing that one of my early managers kind of instilled with me really kind of came out in this chapter for me. And that was along your lines as well of, you know, the, you know, clear and effective communication, but also just this mentality of don't just bring me a problem, uh, mm -hmm. you know, bring me the problem. And also, what are your thoughts on how to how we go address it? Uh, now, the hard part for me as I was, you know, young and, you know, growing into this position was, yeah, I want your opinions on how you think we should fix this, but also know I might not take your path. <laughs> and that was always frustrating to me as, as, as a young engineer. It's like, well, you asked my opinion. Why are we not going to go do it? So uh, that, that's, again, where I really kind of connected with this. Of, um, I think the, the culture gets cooked into this a lot as well. Mm -hmm. and I, I go back to when I was hiring people um, at Cerner and they would ask me, uh, what frustrates you most about this job? And, and believe it or not, my, my answer didn't change for the eight years I interviewed people. And it was, you know, we, we move so quick and we change direction so aggressively sometimes that I've got all these folders of projects that we never got to finish. Mm. And, because we changed corporate imperatives, we changed direction. It could have been a new federal mandate that came out. Um, it could be any number of things. And and as a leader, that frustrated me that we didn't get to see some of these projects through to the end. Yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> Kelly, think, anything to add there? Yeah, for me, this chapter brought back uh, the nightmare that became um, servant leadership back in the day when that that was new. A lot of people adopted that mindset, but didn't read the book or the research. And so it became, it reminded me of KC Masterpiece Barbecue. You know, that restaurant, you walk in and you're way over there at the door and they're yelling, hi, may I help you? Hi, may I help you? They're yelling at you. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? So um, in this chapter, she really talks about how um, strong players, contributors, good contributors, they take action. But the minute there's an obstacle, they turn it over to the boss. And then bosses these days, a lot of times, leaders aren't strong leaders, they're not impactful, and they take that, um, they're like yelling from their desk, Hi, how may I help you, how may I help you? And, uh, and they take it on to them when that's the wrong thing to do too, because then the employee doesn't learn or, you know, then they're not delegating, they have too much. So it really, I, I felt like this was one of the big ones that would distinguish strong contributors from key impact players. So I think it's um, definitely one worth paying attention to. And, and it, that's amazing. I mean, you just set up my next comment perfectly. I don't know how you could okay. have planned that any better, but she had a, a header called 100% done and then some. And remember, yeah. the topic today is impact players. So we're trying to differentiate or separate, you know, what really separates those two, which she calls contributors and yeah. impact players. And, and she goes into length about uh, basically creating work for your boss. And, it, right. and it, she talks a lot about emails, which I think I've been on the receiving end as we all have of so many of these emails where you read this and, and who's ever sending it, are they subordinate to you? Are they lateral to you above you? It doesn't matter, but, but are they asking you to do something? And then you see the length of the email trail go back and forth. And yeah. I always tried to coach my team to say, hey, when you send an email, you should have an expectation of what you're asking, what kind of response you're going to get. You know, are you creating work for your boss or are you solving a problem yeah. for your boss? And, and I just, as I read that, I thought this is just spot on. And again, think about how you act and how you perform mm -hmm. and are you being an impact player or are you being a contributor the contributor sends an email kind of what i call fire and forget it type email yeah. 
and it has no no comprehension of, of really what the downstream impact of that email is. The impact player, on the other hand, sends this well articulated email, summarizes it with an executive summary, and has an idea of what they expect the response and the impact to be. And again, we're just trying to differentiate. Hey, do you want to be an impact player, or are you content and happy to just live at the contributor level? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those are great points, Brett. I, I, I think back as you're talking about that to another book I, I read years ago. I think I've read it three times now, The Four Hour Work Week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, in that book, he talks about, you know, just the how effectiveness of communication. And I don't advocate going this extreme, but his practice was um, you need to uh, put an out of office on that says, I will only answer emails Monday morning between 8 and 8 10 a.m. Uh, wow. <laughs> most organizations, that's probably not going to work for you. But um, most times I try to be very uh, disciplined about, you know, having set times throughout the day when I check email, because otherwise mm -hmm. I'm, I'm drawn into it and it becomes somewhat un very unproductive, quite honestly, mm -hmm. with the constant back and forth. And the, one of the many things I took away from the book that I still use that just really is a pet peeve of mine. If someone outside of my organization is wanting to meet, it seems like it takes five emails back and forth to, okay, well, what time works for you? Well, I don't know what time works for you. And in the book, he says, come right out in front and propose and say, I propose you know, next Tuesday at 10 a.m. If this doesn't work, you suggest another time. So uh, yeah, it, it really all fits together, you know, when we think about how we lead and how we communicate and how we manage our time. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Do you Anything want to go else to add there before we jump ahead, Kelly? No, I think, I mean, I, I made notes on every chapter like you did, but I think in the interest of time, should we go to the chapter eight? Yep, chapter eight's built and a high impact about that team. the whole time. Yes, it is. That's that's the big part of the book. I was really, really impressed. You know, as I read the book, I was impressed all the way. But once I got to chapter eight, I'm like, holy cow, this is the big part. So, and, and it's a big, it build a high impact team. So, Everybody, I'm sure, has been on a team that was really a high-performing, high-impactful team. And unfortunately, they never stay together forever. That's just kind of the nature of teams. Yeah. You know, you, the same team doesn't win the World Series or the Super Bowl every year. Players move on. And, and obviously, that's, that's generally in the best interest of the player because they're developing, they're progressing, whether they leave for more money, whatever the case may be. But the bottom line is, is that we've, you know, we've all had that experience. And you reflect back and you say, what made that team such a high performing team. What, what made it so impactful? And Weissman goes down, down the trail of talking about this analyst that was she worked with called, her name was Lauren Hancock. And it was really ironic as, as I was reading her text about Lauren Hancock, because I kept replacing Lauren with an avatar of a gentleman that I had worked with in a previous life. And every time Lauren's name came up, I replaced that. And I mean, literally, I could have written that text for her. It was just so similar. And I was so moved by it. I actually took you know, about a page out of the book and typed in an email and sent it to this gentleman. I said, that's you, that's you. And then so you say, well, what makes Lauren so impactful? She made everybody's work easier. Yeah. Every project that came up, people wanted her on the team because she was a high contributor. Her work never needed checking. And people, I think, I don't remember exactly how she phrased it, but it was basically, uh, it was 98% done every time. In other words, she could give her the Lauren an assignment and she never had to go back and check on it. It was just in the bag. She gave her the project and I'm, I'm sure Lauren had an ability or a knack to ask the right questions so that she didn't have any loose ends. She took the project and ran with it. But Lauren was so effective in what she did that she became so highly sought after. She was wanted on every project. And I was, I call them glue players, right? They're the person that kind of holds it together. And when you see a project or you've got an assignment, you just can't imagine doing the project without that person. And this was the same story that I was sharing with you from the person that I worked at worked with before. The, the point that I make with all this is saying, hey, that's a high impact player. And then you ask yourself and you reflect and you say, hey, am I that kind of player? And if I'm not, why? Or how can I be? You know, what skills and abilities, what, you know, what gaps in my skill set do I have that would allow me to be that type of a player? Some of it's personal, obviously, personality, you know, culture, mm -hmm. you know, your natural abilities. And some of it are hard skills that you can go out and acquire. But I, I just really, really like that part of the book. Dave? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because as I read that chapter as well, I immediately connected and, uh, you know, put a face with uh, a business analyst that worked on my team. And uh, this this woman could do things with Excel that just would blow everybody's <laughs> mind. And, you know, just like you're saying, because of her skills and abilities, um, 
you know, other teams were constantly coming over going, hey, if anyone can figure this out, she can. And what we didn't we didn't realize is, uh, you know, every time we'd go into a team meeting and she would plug into the projector and present something, she always had this way about uh, taking just two or three minutes to show all of us something new that we didn't know with Excel. And it was ah. always, look what I did with this formula. And it, it wasn't bragging about her ability. It was her taking the opportunity to, to teach the rest of us. So unknowingly, every week in the team meeting, we all learned just a little bit new about Excel. And, and kind of like, as, as the book pointed out, uh, what happened was she got the attention of a lot of people higher up in the organization. And uh, we suddenly got the message of, yeah, we're taking her from you. Oh, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we bragged about her abilities. We showed her off and our, our, uh, our payment for uh, our generosity was we lost a good resource. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Uh, I'm with you, Brett, that, that chapter really resonated, I think, in terms of being able to identify people that I've had the, the privilege of working with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the point you make is where we open, you know, great teams, high performing, you know, highly efficient teams, they never stay together forever. And I'm sure, you know, much like I was talking about you, you really, you didn't want to see that high impact player leave or move on, but you knew at the end of the day that it was best for her. And, and uh, you certainly wanted, didn't want to hold her back, you know, and, and kind of, I don't know, hold her on the team. But the bottom line is when you, when you're on one of those teams, you, you, you kind of know it in the moment, but then again, maybe you don't. And then a year or two later down the road, you reflect back and just said, hey, you know what? The chemistry was just right there for a period of time. And, and I, I've said it, and I, I still believe this, putting a team together and hiring a team is the hardest job of being a leader. I, I, I've never seen that in print. I should do some research on that. But I just know that when you get it right, it's really, really powerful. But if you're wrong, obviously it's painful. But get high, the making the great hire, that's always one of the most challenging parts of being a leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think when you, to get it right is really hard, but it's harder when it's wrong to make those changes. I agree. Yeah, that's the- Anything that's to add to chapter eight, Kelly? Well, I thought I just wanted people to know she has um, tools in there like that. Coachability, mindset. She gives some good resources, kind of a scale um, that you can use. And um, and there was something else. Um, oh, a lot of information about culture in that chapter as well. Um, so there's really good tools in there that make recruiting and the high, you might want to fine tune your hiring process to get the right team. And um, And she gives some ideas for that. Well, in addition to that, so many of the things that she has listed in the book are actionable. Yes. You know, they're, they're, yes. they're things that you can literally put into action immediately. Now, yeah. you know, the impact of your action is going to take some time to be noticed by your organization and, and your leadership. But there's several things in the books that are actionable. So, uh, you know, barring any other comments from Dave and Kelly, I think that's a wrap on impact players. We've just got some closing comments. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts before we move to those guys? I think, you know, kind of the, the, the big thing that I took away from this is, you know, that this no, notion that really, you know, uh, every day we're presented with some sort of, of challenge, no matter how big or small, that we could potentially turn into an opportunity. And when you look at the people that, um, you know, have, have, have been good at their job versus people that have been great at their job, those people that excel up the corporate ladder, uh, that's exactly what they've done is they've, they've viewed um, things that many people might view as a hindrance and look for an opportunity to improve, correct, and, and better not just themselves, the organization, and their, their team. So uh, great book. Uh, I took a lot away from it. It was a good read. Yeah. And, um, adding on to that, they, um, one of the last sentences of the whole book, um, last paragraph, she says, how impact, impact players um, bring have value and bring capability. They make themselves more valuable than others. So it's not that, that others aren't valuable too. They just go go a little bit further. They play bigger. They turn uncertainty and ambiguity into opportunity. In today's yeah, I, I, world, I mean, holy moly, we need that. Well, and I, there was one section in the book early on where it it, it, and it, it talked about doing the doing the hard job, you know, going above yeah. and beyond. I actually shared that with my daughter, and I said, you know, here's an example of of somebody who says, you know, what you got to put in a little yeah. extra. So, yeah. hey, we're, we're we're getting at the end of our time here, so let's yeah, close. We are. Yep. So next month, everybody, March 24th uh, at 4 p.m. I, I think that's a Thursday, is it not, Kelly? Yep, it is. Yep. So March 24th at 4 p.m. Uh, and, and as you guys know, we go through some painstaking effort to try to find titles that are valuable. So we've agreed that next month is, to be honest, lead with power, truth, justice, 
and Purpose by Ron Carucci. So uh, he's the co-founder and managing partner of Navalent. It's a Seattle-based leadership and strategic consulting firm. He's done two TED Talks. He's authored eight books, and he's a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review. So as I was putting that together, I said, you know, there's an 800-pound gorilla here in that he comes from the consulting uh, author world. And, you know, we, Kelly and I have made a, a pretty hard stake in the ground that, hey, we really want people with real-world commercial experience. Uh, but we're going to kind of take one here. Uh, yeah. Everybody that I've, I've, all the reviews that I've read said this is definitely a text that's worth our time, despite the fact that uh, the author doesn't come from commercial business. So the recording of today's conversation uh, is actually going to be posted on the Voyage Consulting website. So uh, I love quotes, as I've told you guys. Kevin O'Leary with Shark Tank is credited with the quote Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. So you can actually forward that URL from the website. So if you're getting value from these and all the other previous conversations are actually posted there as well, please, please, please forward those uh, and it will increase our following. So thank you again for joining this afternoon or if you're you know, viewing the recording, that's also good. But uh, you know, we welcome suggestions. Oh, we love those suggestions, love feedback and comments. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, my last thought here is stay curious, keep reading and never, never, never stop growing. So Kelly, Yay, that is it. Stay curious, keep reading, and keep growing. I love it. Dave, anything else? Nope. Thanks, everybody. I agree. Uh, it reminds me of a guy I follow that does uh, uh, learning how to fly a plane. And one thing he always says at the end of every one of his his teachings is a good pilot is always learning. So ah, perfect. Very, very easily to this as well. I like to know that in a pilot. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so we like it in leaders too, and we're doing our part to help a, a little bit outside of what we normally do every day. So we hope that everybody does find these useful. And um, this one, we do think it's worth you reading the book. So uh, mm -hmm. enjoy and continue your development. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon.